What's up guys, Wade here, welcome to another video. So this one's going to be a little bit different. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the Warburg effect and cancer cell metabolism. So as you can see, this video is done on behalf of the AMP for the WAP group. This is a student-run organization created by a now fifth-year medical student by the name of Simon Fraser King. Uh, the group was created with the help of aiming those who are trying to get into the FITS graduate entry medicine program. So basically, uh, as I mentioned, it's student run. We have a number of GEMP1 and GEMP2 students who assist in tutorials and giving information to students who are trying to get into the program. We also have some information and summaries prepared that will help you with your preparation for studying for the WAPT, which is the VITS test that you need to write in order to get into the program. I've left links in the description box below for our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram pages. Give those a follow for updates and information on tutorials and the like, as well as little quizzes to test your knowledge and progress. I've also left a link to our Telegram group. If you join this group, you can access study material and summaries to help you prepare for the WAPT. Uh, so join that group to help you get started. Now, an awesome guy by the name of Alon runs the Instagram page for us for the M for the WAPT. And uh, he's a GAMP1 student, and he sets little quizzes pretty much every week on the page. Uh, just to test your knowledge and to gauge your progress uh, in your preparation for the WAPT. And one of the questions he said about a week ago or so was about the Warburg effect and we thought we'd do a quick video to explain the basics of this effect. So to start with an overview, I'm going to briefly touch on normal cellular metabolism first so that you have an understanding of what normal is before we look at what happens in cancer cells. I'll then talk briefly about the Warburg effect itself and lastly about why this process may happen. So we start with glucose, which we get fundamentally from our diet, from carbohydrates and the like, which are then transformed into glucose. So glucose moves into the cell by facilitated diffusion, and in the cytosol of the cell it undergoes a process called glycolysis, which literally translates into sugar splitting. Uh, this process is used basically for the production of energy and ATP. Now there are many steps in the glycolysis pathway, such as the conversion of glucose into glucose 6-phosphate or fructose 6-phosphate or 1,6-bisphosphate and so on and so on. Uh, I'm not really going to go into that here. I'm going to try and keep the steps of each pathway simplified as much as possible for this video, but you can always just go and revise those pathways if you need. For now you can see basically that the end product of glycolysis is pyruvate, and this leads to the production of two molecules of pyruvic acid and two molecules of ATP. What's important to note about glycolysis is that it is an anaerobic process. That is, it doesn't make use of oxygen at all in the pathway, regardless of whether there is oxygen present in the cell or not. No oxygen is used in this pathway at all, and this is important to keep in mind when we look at the Warburg effect. So once we have pyruvate, we move into the pyruvate pathway, and once again there are a number of different outcomes that are possible. I'm only going to really look at two of these, namely lactate and acetyl-CoA. So as we can see, the fate of the two molecules of pyruvic acid depends on the presence of oxygen in the cell. If there is deficient oxygen available, the pathway then proceeds to the formation of lactic acid. If on the other hand there is sufficient oxygen available, which should be the normal case in the cell, the pathway then proceeds via the aerobic route and enters the citric acid cycle, also called the Krebs cycle. Let's have a look at the first option. Um, that meaning if there's deficient oxygen in the cell. The pyruvic acid then forms lactate and this process is known as anaerobic glycolysis. Anaerobic literally meaning no oxygen. By the end of this process, glycolysis and secretion of lactate, there is a total of two ATP molecules produced. But because of the increased lactic acid formation, you also get an increase in the hydrogen ions, which can result in an acidosis and acid-base problems. Let's now have a look at the second option, which is the route that would normally be taken when the cell has sufficient oxygen levels. The pyruvate pathways result in the formation of acetyl-CoA, which moves into the next pathway called the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. This occurs in the mitochondrial matrix of the cell. So again, there are quite a number of steps in the cycle which I'm not really going to go into in this video, but the end product of the cycle is the formation of NADH and FADH2 which are then used to go into the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. The outcome of oxidative phosphorylation is the production of relatively large amounts of ATP. That's to say about 30 to 32 molecules of ATP per glucose molecule that is metabolized. This all goes to say that in the presence of oxygen, 
Metabolism will proceed via oxidative phosphorylation as this pathway yields the greatest number of ATP molecules per glucose molecule. As oxygen levels decrease or in the absence of oxygen, metabolism will then shift and proceed via the process of glycolysis which occurs in the cytosol of the cell. This is called anaerobic glycolysis. So that's just important to keep in mind when we look at the Warburg effect now. Now that we've had a basic look at the processes and outcomes of normal cellular respiration, let's now look at the topic of this video, which is the Warburg effect. So Otto Warburg was a German scientist, and he discovered that there is a major metabolic shift in cancer cells, resulting in their making increased use of glycolysis, despite the presence and availability of sufficient oxygen levels. This became known as aerobic glycolysis and later as the Warburg effect. To understand this, let's just go back and look at the normal pathways again. You have oxidative phosphorylation resulting in about 32 ATP molecules in the presence of oxygen. And if there is limited, reduced or no oxygen in the cell, the cell can still make some energy via anaerobic glycolysis. What Warburg discovered is that cancer cells, even in the presence of sufficient oxygen, fundamentally make use of anaerobic glycolysis and not oxidative phosphorylation. Now, this indicates a metabolic shift from the normal and may seem a bit confusing. Why would cancer cells move away from a pathway that produces about 32 molecules of ATP to one that only produces about two? So this is something that we'll discuss shortly. Another thing to notice is that cancer cells result in a massive uptake of glucose into the cell, almost as if they're hungry for sugar. In cancer cells, this pathway is known as aerobic glycolysis and is known as the Warburg effect. Just on the side, an interesting thing to note is that due to the fact that cancer cells have higher metabolic rates and take up significantly higher rates of glucose, this can actually be used to help in detecting cancer cells. So you have what are called PET scans, and these use radioactive traces made of a special type of glucose, which collect in areas of higher metabolism and are then shown as bright spots on the scan. So overall in cancer cells, you have massive increased levels of glucose uptake, which are then metabolized via glycolysis and not oxidative phosphorylation, which results in large increases in lactate secretion. These increased levels of lactic acid can then result in an acidosis, which is a decrease in the pH of the local microenvironment. Okay, so now that we've looked at the basics of what the Warburg effect is, let's look at why this happens. It may seem counterintuitive at this point, but a number of theories and hypotheses have been proposed to explain this. I'm only going to really look at four of the more popular reasons very briefly. Uh, it is worth noting that there are many others including things such as cell signaling which I haven't really gone into in this video. The four that I'll be looking at are efficiency, assured ATP synthesis, biosynthesis and increased invasiveness. Let's start with efficiency. I've taken this explanation from a study by Liberty and Locus Cell in 2016 and this is a direct quote from their study. Basically they found that the rate of glucose metabolism through aerobic glycolysis is higher such that the production of lactate from glucose occurs 10 to 100 times faster than the complete oxidation of glucose in the mitochondria. In fact, the amount of ATP synthesized over any given period is comparable when either form of glucose metabolism is utilized. Thus, a reasonable hypothesis on the reason that cancer employs aerobic glycolysis should account for the inherent difference in kinetics. So basically what this is saying is that the glycolysis pathway is a more efficient mechanism overall for the cancer cells to make ATP because it's a significantly quicker pathway than the oxidative phosphorylation pathway. The second explanation is that by using this process of glycolysis and not oxidative phosphorylation as a normal cell would, the cancer cell ensures that it has a constant supply of ATP. So it is generally understood that due to its rapid growth, there is always the probability that a tumor will outgrow its oxygen supply. By making use of glycolysis, it is suggested that this assures continuous production of ATP should this happen to the cell. The third explanation is something called biosynthesis. So remember that glucose is a six carbon simple sugar molecule. And as we've noted, the increased glucose consumption in cancer cells is used as a source of carbon for anabolic proliferation of cells including the generation of lipids, proteins, and nucleotides. These are formed from the various pathways leading from glycolysis. So again, basically this is saying that the cancer cells also use the glycolysis pathway to better use the glucose to make components necessary for the proliferation of new cancer cells. 
The last theory or explanation that I'll look at is called increased invasiveness. And this basically says that by using glycolysis instead of oxidative phosphorylation, it allows the cancer cell to have increased evasiveness. As we've touched on before, again, the increased glucose consumption leads to increased lactate secretion, which causes an acidification of the local microenvironment, i.e. an acidosis. Because of the increased hydrogen ion level secreted by the cancer cells, this alters the cell stroma and allows for increased invasiveness of the cancer cells. So when looking at these four explanations together, they, they kind of go hand in hand. They explain how basically the cancer cell is trying to ensure that it has adequate ATP production, uh, even in the absence of oxygen, and that it allows for the cancer cells to proliferate and also to invade the cell stroma. So it may seem quite complicated, but uh, I hope this video has helped to explain the basics of what the Warburg effect is, and I hope that it has helped with your studying. Please remember to follow the Amp for the Web pages, give this video a like, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. And as always, I will see you in the next video.